Back in 2018, we reviewed War of the Ring, the sprawling, asymmetric, beloved war game that took over our table with over 200 miniatures, bamboozled us initially with maybe half as many rules, but then worm-tongued its way into our hearts. It was huge and fiddly, and at first quite frustrating, but when we saw the light, it was a dazzling blast. Niche? Yes, it wasn't for everyone, but my, what an amazing game. And now, finally back in print today, we're looking at the game's younger brother slash cousin, the Battle of the Five Armies. This game is still quite big, but much notably smaller, with a board that, look, you can play on a normal human table. And if you're struggling to see any other differences between that game and this game, then, well, fair enough. But the rules are quite different in subtle, simple ways. Largely, the systems that dictate the rules of both games are quite similar. But there's some crucial changes underneath the bonnet of this uh, elven jeep. There's no hidden hobbit movement mechanic here, with an elite squad moving across the map secretly, trying to throw a ring into a big hot bin. You also don't have to contend with the delightfully frustrating element of the political side of War of the Ring, in which you have to run around the map and just try and convince people that the threat is real before you can even mobilize any of their units. There are far fewer plastic pieces in this, which means setup and teardown is much, much quicker. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that this game is much simpler. Yes, there are fewer mechanics, but for everything stripped away from the design, there are lots of new additions here that do just slightly gunk and fuzz things up. And on this smaller map, the Battle of the Five Armies takes place prior to the events of Lord of the Rings, being one of the final events in Tolkien's previous novel, The Bobbit, Little Bobbit in the Big City. After a botched robbery that ends in the murder of a dragon, our hero, Billy Bobbit, gets smashed in the head with a brick or a rock and misses most of the ensuing battle, which is depicted here in this board game. Humans, elves and dwarves and everyone in between must unite against the forces of darkness as the little goblins try to burrow their way through the mountains. And if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, then check it out. Gandalf is here, as well as uh, Th Thranduil. He's the king of the elves. And, uh... And that's it. That's it, that's your fill. Not a Sean Bean in sight. You've had your supper, now go to bed. So fans of Lord of the Rings might feel a little underwhelmed, but if you're a fan of War of the Ring, then there's a ton of stuff here that you're gonna recognize and love. As players, you'll still roll these gorgeous dice and then take it in turns to play them as specific actions, with the good guys and the bad guys both sharing this seemingly complicated little menu that just explains all of the different things that each of these dice results can do. And so armies shuffle around and smash into one another with handfuls of dice being rolled to determine if your strategies will be backed up by the required luck. So playing as the forces of darkness. It's your job to just cause trouble. Bashing your way into fortifications will get you the points you need to win the game. As you trudge around the mountains with your wogs and big orcs and chip away through their defenses from behind with your little goblins bashing their way through the mountains. Now this is one of the coolest things about Battle of the Five Armies. You can't move these goblins until they've filled up one of their little goblin boxes, at which point they smash through the stone and start spilling out onto the board to cause untold grief. And meanwhile, in the realm of men and their business associates, it's your job to simply hold on against this horrible red explosion. Each turn, you're gonna be pulling a token from a bag or a mug or your trouser pockets or someone else's trouser pockets. Whatever number is on that token is gonna to move the fate track along that many spaces. And if you can get far enough along that fate track, then question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, you've won the battle. And along that track, you're gonna be making new friends. It's your old friend Bilbo. Billy Bagbins, he's here, he's on the board. What can he do? He sort of just like runs away and disappears. Cool, the eagles are coming. I can see them, they're literally just around the corner. They'll be with you in two minutes. Honestly, they're on your road right now. 
And that's not all. It's the shape-shifting murder bear Bjorn from ABBA. Famously one of the most OP characters in the original book, could probably completely win the battle on their own, but doesn't like to get involved. It's your call, Bjorn. You're cool. And finally, it's Thorin. Who's Thorin? I don't know. But he does come with this card in the game, which means I'm pretty sure he's banned from public playgrounds. And listen, if you're simmering quietly with rage now at my lack of respect for The Hobbit and this world, then congratulations, you've activated my trap card. We should probably go and have a frank conversation in the reality check cavern. I like The Hobbit, it's fun, but the characters here aren't nearly as evocative as those in War of the Ring. And Partially that's because the Lord of the Rings had these fabulous films to draw from, vividly painting in all the gaps in my imagination. But mostly here it's the fact that War of the Ring draws from three whole books of stuff, whereas this is just pulling from a chapter in one quite small book. So how could it compare? Anyway, that's that. Get out of my cave. There's a thinness here that can't just be patched over, and it's really quite notable when you're playing as the Forces of Darkness. As the game goes on, the other player is going to be unlocking new characters, adding cards to an increasingly complicated, connected tableau of things that they need to reference and things they can do. Meanwhile, on your side of the table, you've got Bolg. What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Bolg. That's kind of it. It's Bolg. And because Sauron hasn't unlocked the Nazgul on his skill tree yet, instead you've got giant bats that you just sort of plop around on the board and do stuff. Giant bats quite cool, but crucially not the Nazgul. And let alone that, Sauron on his skill tree hasn't even unlocked being Sauron yet. As this player you play as the Shadow, a nebulous force of darkness that has yet to fully show its hand or hands. But much like in War of the Ring, most of the colour that's going to spring up during a game is going to come from these cards that represent the events, the characters, the possibilities that exist within this world. As shown here in this beautiful piece of storytelling in the traditional three-act structure. Sadly, the game didn't ship with the fourth card in this series, which we've unfortunately had to Photoshop ourselves. And the colour that these cards adds doesn't feel nearly as vivid as it did in War of the Ring, but this game does flesh itself out in different ways, adding, for example, a lot more granularity to the tactical side of battles in the game. Each unit type has a corresponding card that you add to your hand whenever they're in that conflict. Both players then choose one card at the start of the round, and if you've played a card that matches one of the units that you've put into that fight, then when you roll the combat dice, for each unit of that, you're going to roll a black die rather than the white one, because if that type of unit hits after you've played that unit's card, then you're going to trigger a special ability on that card, which will then not be discarded from the game, but put into your own discard pile, which you'll then be able to get back during the battle using a regroup card. Sounds a bit fiddly? That's because it is. And that's not all. Some types of terrain have role modifiers that only last for the first round of combat, and each unit has preferred types of terrain, which means before any fight, you're going to check all of the different units and their preferred terrain types and work out which army has the preference, and the winner of that is going to get a free combat card that they can draw up into their hand. And you will forget to do this all of the time because it's slightly one too many rules and it's not quite exciting enough to be worthwhile. A big change here though is that units don't die after they take damage. Instead your armies build a stack of wound tokens that don't trigger until you have more of them than units in that army. At which point you keep discarding two of them at a time in exchange for one unit until you're back below that threshold. Now in principle I really love this and also it is absolutely horrible. For example let's say we've got a fight going on here in good old Dale Town, five units, five wound tokens. Seems bad, but it's fine. Equal number of things and things, which means nobody's hurt. But then we have one more round of combat, and let's say ooh, we take three more wound tokens. Well, that's fine. Just remove two wound tokens, remove a person, fine. How many are there now? Six tokens, four people. Not ideal. Remove two more tokens, remove one more person. 
It's fine. We must be there now. No, four tokens, three people. I guess we remove two more tokens and another person. And now we have two tokens and two people, which is fine, but one more token now. Oh, oh, oh. It's a beautiful idea in principle that you can roam these armies around being ragged and half broken, but still being at their maximum effectiveness. But, huge but, huge orc but. <laughs> It's kind of fiddly and annoying. Honestly, these tokens, these little triangle tokens and keeping track of them and moving them around the board with your armies. You might remember in War of the Ring, there was a special box on the board in which you would go and put armies that were fighting against things because there wasn't enough room. That was fiddly, but you've actually got some breathing room now and that breathing room is immediately kind of swallowed up by cardboard triangles. So in principle, I like it. In practice, it's slightly worse, I think, with a lot of the new tactical systems that weren't in War of the Ring. This idea of having specific combat cards for each type of unit, fun. But in reality, it means you're having to assemble and disassemble your combat hand of cards before each individual fight in the game. And there are lots of them. And also, these new factors to consider and take advantage of don't really change the fact that fights in this game are mostly absolute because yes dice now listen you've made all of the right moves the odds are hugely in your favor but it doesn't matter because yes dice big swings here fives and sixes it often feels quite deeply unfair but once you've learned to accept that once you've realized that, that that's the nature of the thing and washed away that saltiness with a nice big glass of okay whatever, then this is pretty enjoyable stuff. But crucially, I don't remember being quite so frustrated by the luck-based swings in War of the Ring, even though arguably on paper, arguably, arguably on paper, they were exactly the same. And this is the point that I realized that actually a lot of war games are just like this. It's just that maybe War of the Ring is the one war game that I really, really like. And hey, if you, replace the hobbits going to Mordor with a ring with a spy trying to get a package behind enemy lines, then it's literally just World War II, but with a Gandalf. Now, if we're being charitable about dice rolls in games like these, we could say that it actually places more of an emphasis on the wider, broader strategic choices. You can't rely on this, so you have to be tight everywhere else. And maybe that's where these terrain-based bonuses come into play, where you have to chip away and get every tiny advantage you can, because hey, the dice are not your friends. But I don't know about that. Honestly, war games, these binary bash-ups, red versus blue, I increasingly think that they're not about winning at all. The one thing that binds them together is detail, right? These granular little nods to specific little wrinkles. And I always assumed that this focus on detail was for the purpose of accuracy, you know, simulation. And I think a lot of people who are fans of the hobby in this particular part of the genre will still claim that that's the case, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that's all that true. I think the detail here is just about texture. And I think that secretly, war games have a ton more in common than you might expect with role-playing games. Maybe war games are just an exercise in collaborative storytelling in which you explore a familiar setting that then mutates because of the choices you both make and because of the outcomes of rolled dice. And I think that's why my relationship with the Battle of the Five Armies failed to ever really blossom. I just don't have a framework in my imagination for me to play around with. And yet holding those story cards in War of the Ring felt so exciting. It wasn't about winning or losing, it was about luxuriating in a shared bath of possibilities. And whoa, what about if Aragorn did that? What about if Gimli was over there? And oh no, I've literally, I'm just spouting gibberish in exactly the same way that people who are into Marvel films do about those or about dads uh, at barbecues discussing out of uh, production obsolete French tanks. And while that whole generation grew up on a steady feed of macho reimaginings of a world war that they never actually saw, we grew up on the Nazgul. We grew up on Christopher Lee. We grew up with complicated romantic feelings about Aragorn. Right, that, that last bit isn't true. 
there's nothing complicated about it. It's just a straight up vape. But I must say that it is telling that one of the bits you get in the Five Armies box is a mini module for War of the Ring that lets you start that game with a reimagined history in which the Battle of the Five Armies is won by the Shadow. And I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm just not that into it. But if you are, I can, I get it now. I understand war games. I've gone big galactic brain. Thanks. Battle of the Five Armies is fun, but it doesn't gain that much from the additional tactical rules and detail that have been added, and it loses a lot from the stuff that's not here. The, the narrative, the characters having this rich quantity of stuff to draw from misses out on that, but also political aspect, the spy mission to the volcano. Lots of really, really exciting stuff that just isn't here. And so while I'd love to say that this is like, hey, it's like War of the Ring, but a more mini manageable version. It's just lacking so much of that spark that I'm not entirely sure who it would be for other than diehard Tolkien people. And there's a lot of stuff in this that's still kind of annoying in the same way that War of the Ring is, like the miniatures. Yeah, it's okay if you're the bad guys, all quite different, but you know, what's the difference between a pikeman and an arrowman and an arrow elf? I don't know. Um, the bases are different, but apart from that, it's, it's Squint City. And so it's my opinion that Battle of the Five Armies is a game that doesn't really find room to exist beneath the shadow of its frankly startlingly terrifyingly large older brother. And that's a really disappointing conclusion for everybody involved, I think we can agree. But I am taking some heart from the sort of realization I've had that maybe a lot of wargaming is just World War II fanfic being unknowingly written by 60 year old men. I think a lot about the first time I ever went to a big board game convention and how within 30 feet of each other you had children having a great time playing the My Little Pony collectible card game and older gentlemen having a great time playing their World War II war games. And at the time, I remember being quite sad about the fact that often that second group, those older men, would look down on other parts of the hobby. Now, at the time, I knew that those men were wrong. Okay, that's part of the reason why I personally helped to build this channel and do what we do. And it's definitely a part of why I still do what I do, of proving those people wrong, proving that actually this hobby is for everyone. But now I can see just how wrong they were and how it doesn't matter how you package it up. It doesn't matter what kind of texture you have on the canvas. We're all just doing the same things. You can dress it up however you want and you can pretend if you like that your thing is better than someone else's thing as I do so often and everyone does and it's not a great human habit, let's be real. But we're all just doing the same thing. We're all just having a wonderful time exploring the stories that we love, thrilled that we get to do so with other people who care about these things as much as we do. And I think that's kind of beautiful. I think that's beautiful. And certainly while this game, I couldn't find a place for it in my head or my heart, playing it was a reminder of why I do this and why I care about this. And I'm thankful of it for that alone. And hey, if you've enjoyed this video, I'm just gonna say, you know, Shut up and sit down. We've been going for 10 years. We've grown the team recently. I'm proud to do so. And I'm proud to continue to, to put this out into the world. And uh, yeah, if you watch our videos a lot, but you've never clicked the subscribe button, then hey, you could do that. That would be really great. We'd really appreciate that. And uh, we usually mention it once or twice a year, but hey, we are donations funded as well. So if you fancy donating to this project that we've been doing now for 10 years, then you can go to shutupandsitdown.com forward slash donate. Deeply unusual for me to ever mention that outside of our, our allotted two times a year allowance. But hey, I'm, a, I'm feeling kind of emotional about this. And I'm realizing, just realizing that those old men were wrong has made me feel um, good, pretty good inside. And I, hopefully if you are one of those old men watching this, then you can find it in your heart to listen to what I've said and at least consider it. No funny ending this time. Sorry, I got a bit real. Love to you all. We'll see you next time.